Well, I don't know about you guys, but I missed being in our location last week, but I really enjoyed getting to spend Resurrection Sunday at a, a remote location. And, and I don't know what it was about it, and I guess I'll have to give Mike credit, but it was in his message that some things were revealed to me on, in his message on who moved the stone. And it got me thinking about some things that um, I had going on in life and stuff. And, but Mike stated that it was God who moved the stone. And then he shared why. He said, so that we can see our past be forgiven and our future in Christ secure. And he said the tomb wasn't the end, it was the beginning. And when we realize that the tomb was filled with hope and love and the promise of eternal life, then there's a choice we have to make if we want to accept those gifts. If we want to have part of that hope, love, and the promise of eternal life, we have to make a choice. And that choice is accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And, and surrendering the, the life that we once had control over, the life that we lived, and enter into that life that He is now over, that He is now controlling, and follow Him with every action, word, and deed that we show from that point on. And if you haven't made that choice yet, I want to ask, why not? What, what's keeping you from holding back? Now, I suspect one of the main answers may be, you know, I've just done too many bad things for, for God to love and accept me. So today I want to address this very thing as we begin a series on this process of transformation. I know you've all heard it. We've done VBSs about it. We've, we've done other series about it, but this, this, it's a process. This coming into a life of Christ Today, we're going to look at the first step, and that is justification. Now, in a, in a nutshell, justification is God's gracious judicial verdict in advance of the day of judgment. Th this is that point where guilty sinners, after turning in, in self-despairing trust to Jesus, are forgiven and acquitted of all charges of the past and being declared morally upright in God's sight. Now again, this is only possible because of what we heard of the events that took place last week, but also what we read in the Gospels. Now, before God and His law, humans stand condemned. And there is no way that, that we can put ourselves right before God. But God has a way of, 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 of making sinners right with himself, bringing them back into his righteousness. And justification is the key component of God's saving work. Justification is this great exchange where both the sins of his people were put onto Christ's account. And he paid the price. And also the righteousness of Christ's obedience in, in both the, uh, the life and the death are put into the, the sinner's account. And it is by faith in Christ that, that sinners follow the plan of salvation and are justified. And the benefits that result from this truth are enormous and the implications are significant. Now, without a doubt, this is good news. And this good news concerning God's justification of sinners by faith in Christ alone, without the addition of, of human deeds or the church's administrations, was the biblical truth that the church lost many centuries ago. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, if you've been here very long, when I said the addition of human deeds, you're thinking, well, then baptism's not essential. No, it is essential. I'm talking about without the addition of us just doing good things to, to be right with God. And I'll, I'll cover that a little later as well. But 
th this truth that's been lost and, and been messed with, it, it was rediscovered by Protestant reformers and is one of the distinctive features of evangelical Protestantism. Now, that's a big word. I've been hanging out with George, so I've been learning a few, few new words. But, but this, this biblical truth, this, this biblical doctrine is a precious doctrine that is constantly attacked and misrepresented. But to find out how this justification works, we have to have a theology that is based in the scriptures. Now, in the early 1500s, Martin Luther emphasized what he called the five solas. Now, solas mean, sola means alone. So these, he, he emphasized these five alone statements that are relevant in, to justification. And here they are, and these can be found in scripture. The first one is, it is by God's grace alone. Our theology must be grace-saturated. If we are saved by faith, then we are not saved by works, but by grace alone. And grace is God's generous disposition by which he lavishes us with good things that we do not deserve. The second statement was, through our faith alone. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Like the empty hand of a beggar, faith reaches out to receive Christ. And we believe that he who has promised is able to perform that which he promises. God will fulfill his, pur his purposes, but if we do not believe, then we will not be established. The third statement was in Christ alone. Theology must be Christ-focused. And we should believe everything Scripture teaches us because it is God's Word. And in that Word, Christ is the main point. And the whole Bible testifies to Him. The fourth statement is, to God's glory alone. Theology must be God-dominated. Each of the three persons of the Trinity... The, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it, it saves us in harmonious unity in a way that leads to worship of all three divine persons. We have fellowship with the Son in grace, with the Father in love, and with the Holy Spirit in strength and comfort. And because we have nothing that we have not received, we should do all things in the name of Jesus Christ giving thanks to, to God, the Father, through him. We, we live by, by the Spirit and, and, ge and keep in step with the Spirit. And if we should live to God's glory, then should we not listen to the Spirit speaking his word, receiving God's grace through faith in Christ alone, all to God's glory alone? The fifth statement is, with Scripture alone being the ultimate authority for truth. Theology must be spiritually grounded. God's life-giving speech reveals to us his salvation and calls us to faith and repentance. We were once darkness, but now we are the light in the Lord. And Satan goes about blinding the minds of unbelievers lest they see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Yet the God who commands light to shine out of darkness shines in our hearts, giving us this light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Now I want to shift gears here a little bit. and I mentioned that justification is spelled out in the scriptures. But to appreciate justification... And to be able to understand and grasp how important it is, we must keep something in mind. And that is that God is the absolute standard. If we want any part of the justi justification we find in the scriptures, we must start with one true and living God, God Father, Son, and Spirit. This, this triune God is 
the ultimate moral standard. Throughout history, many have acknowledged that the Lord is righteous. For example, Pharaoh in, in Exodus 9.27, he says, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one. And I add my people are the wicked ones. This, this absolute standard of, of what is right is expressed in the Mosaic law and is summarized in the Ten Commandments. But we also see it witnessed in the character and life of Jesus the Messiah, who, who was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he remained without sin. In his October 8, 2012, Turning Point Daily Commentary, David Jeremiah writes this. He said, remember when you first drew pictures with an Etch-a-Sketch? If you wanted to change your mind, you could simply shake it and everything would disappear and you could start all over again. It's one of the most popular toys in history. Unfortunately, too often our society writes its moral standards on its own Etch-a-Sketch. Our cultural sense of right and wrong is based on a social consensus not the unchanging word of God. In abandoning the absolute standards of a holy God, we've become a world in which morality is relative. It's whatever people want it to be. Christians take a different view. The Lord didn't write his commandments on an etch-a-sketch. They were carved in stone, indicating their durable and permanent value. The commands of God flow from his character and establish a moral baseline of the universe. No matter how hard it tries, this world can never erase the truth of God's word or the demands of his Ten Commandments. They are rock solid, and we can base our moral codes on the tablets of his holiness. And David is absolutely correct. God is the absolute standard, and a person will not find true justification unless they surrender to the same moral standard that is found in God. And surrendering to these, these moral standards are extremely needed because human beings, even though they are created in, in the image of God and are accountable to him, we all fall short of the ultimate standard of righteousness. God's assessment of the human condition is beyond dispute. No one is righteous or good. And in Romans 3, 9 through 23, it says this, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both the Jews and the Greeks are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for, for God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those under the law. So that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But apart from the law, the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe... For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, God's law condemns us before the, the presence of Christ, and we can only acknowledge our sinfulness. No one can stand upright before God. So I ask you then, how, how can a person be right with God? We, we may try whatever we would like, make whatever excuses we want to, or, or live in a hope that 
God will just look favorably on our, our actions and overlook what is evil. But all of that will be to no advantage because the whole of humanity is condemned. And the Bible is clear that, that disobedience to God's will results in a death sentence. And I'll have to say that, that the righteous judge of all the earth is perfectly justified in pronouncing guilty sinners worthy of eternal damnation. And, and Jesus made it clear that it was possible for God to justify sinful people in, in Luke 18. In, in verses 10 through 14, it says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I, I, thank, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes up to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to the house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Knowing that, that God justifies justly, how can sinful humanity ever be justified by God? We read in, in Proverbs seventeen fifteen, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them are alike an, an abomination to the Lord. That's referring to man judging. But when it comes to the justification of sinners, God does what is humanly impossible. He has provided a, a righteous way for declaring sinners righteous in the sight, in his sight, while remaining devoted, fair and true to his own righteous character. And he does this through his son, Jesus, who became the, the human Messiah, fulfilling the, the Old Testament promises. Jesus is God's answer to the human predicament. He, he took on this human nature to rescue humanity by becoming the representative head of his people and their substitutionary sacrifice. And as Adam was the original representative head of, of humanity and, and all are united to him in his sin, condemnation and death, so Christ is the last Adam, is the representative of those who belong to him. But unlike Adam, he is also their substitute. And as a result of his obedient life leading to his death and resurrection, Jesus has given the name Lord having gained the victory over the principalities and powers. But also, he's, he's given the name Savior, as his earthly name Jesus implies. Now, contrary to some recent teachings, justification lies at the heart of the Christian message. For it, it presents real hope to guilty, rebellious humans who, do, who deserve nothing than for God's wrath to fall upon them. The gospel of God's justifying grace proclaims that sinful people who put their trust in Jesus have all their sins forgiven. And they are placed in a right legal standing before God and are no longer condemned. Now there are some teachings out there where, where they want to take this biblical step and in this plan of salvation and change it to fit whatever their group wants to hear. Whatever makes it easier for more people. So I want to touch on a few facts that dispute some of the teachings you, you hear when you leave these doors. The first of those is the biblical doctrine of justification is an act of God in the sense of a legal declaration. It's a judicial pronouncement. It is not declaring what is already a reality 
from eternity past or what will be in the future. But it is God's actual decision which takes place when a person believes and surrenders their life to him in the waters of baptism. This declaration is not a process or creative work of God in believers that makes them morally better, but the divine judge's verdict in advance of the day of judgment. This concept of becoming a morally better becoming morally better is what you hear you're going to hear about in a couple of weeks when George talks about sanctification. That's the process in which we become morally better. It's not an instant result. The second fact is that this judicial act is a gracious verdict. It displays the amazing, undeserved kindness of God. To those whom God makes this legal pronouncement have done nothing to earn or be worthy of it. And therefore, they have nothing of which to boast in themselves. There is nothing that you and I can do to earn the forgiveness of Jesus, other than making a decision. The third fact is that justification consists of two parts. The remission of sins and the imputation of Christ's righteousness. It involves the forgiveness of sins. Sin is no longer reckoned to the believer's account. And secondly, the righteousness is credited to the believer's account. Believers are not left in some morally neutral state. The moral righteousness of Christ is credited to them. Justification is, is not about a change in nature. Rather, it's about a righteous status that results from the righteous character of Christ being credited to believers. The fourth fact is that justification is based upon the Spirit's work of regeneration and renewal. Next two sermons, regeneration and renewal. But entirely on, the, and entirely on the person and work of Christ. The, he is the suffering servant whom Isaiah prophesied. The guilt of God's people was transferred to him and he paid the price by receiving the punishment payment that was due. And the obedient service, servant's righteousness was transferred to them so that they were accounted righteous. And in this, God is able to pardon the ungodly on the grounds of Christ's redemptive death. The fifth fact is that it is through faith at our baptism that sinners are justified. This faith is not to be seen as an acceptance that we have already been justified in eternity past. Again, it's a, current, it's a current decision and a current gift from God. And we see in the scripture where both Peter and Paul use the phrase, in order to be justified. Neither is faith to be thought of as believing in a doctrine of justification. Faith is reliance on the Jesus whose person and work is revealed in scripture. Faith is simply a channel or the empty hand that receives God's free gift. And again, Martin Luther described it as a self-despairing trust. It is not through faith and works or faith in our love that we are justified, but through faith alone. The sixth fact is that justification must never be considered without reverent reference to the believer's union with Christ. This justified person is found in Christ. A relationship with Christ. Union with Christ is central to the believer's whole salvation from the effectual calling to glorification. And justification is one of the crucial elements and must not be isolated from the rest. God wants this relationship with us. Now, these are just, again, some facts of some teachings you're going to hear out there where, where they go completely off the rails, off the biblical scriptures uh, in their teachings. But even if you present those things, there are still going to be some things that people are going to argue with over justification. And, and some will argue that it's, it's simply out of date. But when you dive into the scriptures, you will see that the legal language 
relating to justification is biblical and not, not at all outmoded. People are, are constantly crying out for justice or being brought before a judge in the court of law where a verdict of guilty or not guilty is declared. And it's the same way in our spiritual walk with Christ. There's still a verdict that has to be given, guilty or not guilty. The second thing they'll argue with is they'll say it's, it's legal fiction. Justifying the ungodly who believe in Jesus is not legal fiction. For Christ, who, who thought his perfect, who through his perfect obedience and sacrifice, has fulfilled all the demands of the law so that they are accounted as righteous in Christ, as Christ is. The third, fa uh, third thing they'll argue is, they will say that it encourages lawlessness. This, this freedom of justification is in, in no way encouraging lawless living as a Christian. This is where the, the believer's union with Christ, that relationship is so important for those who are justified are consecrated to God and have new desires to please and serve Him. This doesn't mean that we can just go out and do whatever we want because Christ said we're good to go. We still live according to the laws of the land where morality steps in. Because there's some laws out there that I do not follow because they are not moral laws. But I follow what God's law is, God's moral law. The fourth thing they argue is they will even try to use the Bible to say that it contradicts James's teaching regarding faith and works. When James emphasizes that we are justified not by faith alone, but by works, he is concer concerned to make clear that faith is not a mere acceptance of the facts, such as demons have. There's more to just believing. All you got to do is believe. No, there's more to that. And, the, and the, the works that come is because we want to because of that faith not because we have to to earn that faith. Faith without deeds is dead. And the faith that embraces Christ for justification is one that issues, uh, one that issues in a righteous life. There are a few places in the Bible where the verb to justify has a demonstrative rather than a declaring meaning. Ahab and Abraham for, for instance, were justified or shown to be righteous by their works. We are not declared righteous by our good works, but by the good works that God gives believers to demonstrate their righteous position in Christ. Now, with all this talk about justification, one might ask, what is the benefits of justification? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because Benefit number one is we have peace with God. The, the relationship that was broken by sin has now been reestablished. The second is there is a sure and certain hope for a future beyond this present world order. There's more to our life than what we face here on earth. The third is assurance is based not on feelings but on the truth that believers as believers, we are righteous before God through Christ's obedience and blood. We have an assurance that, that our faith, our, our, uh, we are saved, that we will be with Jesus. Fourth is, we are adopted into God's family. We all know how important family is and, and how we can lean on each other. And it's the same way here. We are adopted into God's family. The fifth is, we belong to the one covenant community. I, I, I loved two Fridays ago when we had the community service. And it was cool that all of us have something in common. We, we have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, not, all, not everybody that's there can be right. We all have different views on, on things in the Bible. But we can still be a community of believers and just have brothers or sisters in error, but we still love them. We still have to be together and work together. As the Gentile did not need to become Jews in order to join the group, so too is the membership of the church. And it is open to all who trust in Christ alone for their acceptance with God. 
The sixth is, it is a liberating message for those who are weighed down with the burden of guilt and despair over their sinful state. When doubts and fears arise and, and accusations are made, the Christian can remember it is God who justifies who is to condemn. It doesn't matter what the world thinks of us, the way we live our lives. All we got to remember is it ain't them who's judging us. It's, it's God who has the final say. The seven is we are blessed to know that we do not have to strive for approval and acceptance. All God asks for is our obedience. We ain't got to prove ourselves to anyone. We ain't got to be accepted by anyone. It's just we just got to be obedient to Christ. And the eighth is this biblical doctrine gives all the glory to God and leaves the justified sinner lost in wonder, love, and praise. And I think we've all been there. Now I have a video for you that, that gives a little humorous uh, insight into what justification may look like when we get to heaven. But again, the, the concept behind the video is 100%. So take a look. Next. File, please. Mm -hmm. Some lying some stealing, and some acts of kindness here and there. I tried to live a good life. Well, let's see how good. This way. Next. File, please. Okay, I admit it. I did a lot of bad things. Yes, I see. But I've done good things too, you know, to offset the bad things. Like, one time, I cheated on a test, but then I cleaned up trash in the park. Mm-hmm. That should balance out, right? Let's find out. This way. That should have balanced out, right? It should have balanced out. Next. Bio, please. Impressive. Oh yeah, I devoted my entire life to make this world a better place. I dug wells in Africa, I donated blood every month, and I ran an orphanage in India. I mean, I just wish I could have done more. Mm-hmm. And is this your subscription? I only read the articles. I, I only read the articles. I only read the articles. Next. My mom goes to church. Was baptized as a baby? Take American Express, right? Next. File, please. Whoa. Somebody's been busy. Well, let's get this over with. Sorry, um, I didn't know he was with you. Okay, step on the scale. Not you. Him. Hey, wait a minute. That is totally not fair. That's why it's called grace. We are saved through grace, saved by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ at our baptism to live our life for him. That is the plan from before creation. And to all those who haven't accepted that gift yet, all I can ask and say is there's never been a better time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of grace that you have shown us, especially through this, this gift of justification. Father, there's never been a, a time in this world where we have been forgiven as much as you've forgiven us or, or shown the love that you show us. So, Father, I pray that uh, we 
grasp that understanding of, of what it all looks like. What all you've done to make it possible. And that we can just hold on to that and know that one day that, that there is what's going to get us to see you, Lord. Father God, I, I pray that uh, we can continue on in this process of transformation as we, as we continue to learn more and more about it and, and complete the whole system that you have put in place far before you even put us on this earth because you knew that it had to be done. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name.